The church year moves through Advent and Lent, and so we are brought to these holy days. But this year, they aren't quite what we'd hoped for. Instead of gathering in the sanctuary to remember Jesus' last meal with his disciples, we are, well, I'm not sure where you are. I'm at my dining room table with this image of the Garden of Gethsemane projected behind me. But this unexpected way of worship is also a reminder that God works through circumstances that are less than ideal to bring us to new places of understanding. Reading from the Gospel of Luke. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus and his disciples have gathered to share the Passover meal. At the end of the meal, the disciples knew exactly what to expect, or they thought they knew what to expect. Passover rituals call for passing the bread at the end of the meal as a reminder of the people's passing from slavery into freedom. They also drink a final cup of wine as a reminder of the tasks still waiting for God's people. But when Jesus picked up the bread, he didn't recite the familiar liturgy. During this meal, which is a celebration of deliverance from slavery, Jesus sets the script aside and talks about broken bodies and blood. In the midst of uneaten scraps of food and dirty plates, in the midst of betrayal and denial and misunderstanding, in the very messiness of human life, Jesus reveals what true deliverance is. He shows them love. And he continues to do that for each one of us. He calls us to gather around him, to participate with him in the love and life of God. And so we gather to worship and be touched by God's grace. We come to remember that the one we call Lord loves us so much that he gave his life for us. Here, we can set aside our resentments and weaknesses and failures, and with thankful hearts, acknowledge our need for God's grace, open ourselves to the outpouring of God's love, and be filled with hope and courage. Friends, wherever you are, we come to this table, the table of our Lord, and you are invited. Bring your uncertainties, your hurts, your regrets, and find peace. Bring your burdens, your pains and struggles, and find relief. Bring your mistakes, your failures, your sin, and feel forgiveness. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Those to, who come to me shall never hunger. And those who believe in me, he says, shall never thirst. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. Let us pray. Ever gracious God, we gather as friends gathered with Jesus in an upper room so many years ago. We come bearing the marks of a bitter and broken world. We come with dry and thirsty spirits. Remind us in the breaking of the bread of our need and of your sufficiency. Refresh us and make us whole through the cup of forgiveness. In these moments, draw us close to you and to one another that we might be filled with love. Receive our prayers of thanksgiving as in silence we remember all your gifts to us.
Hear us, O oh God, as we pray now for all who suffer, for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and oppressed, and all who suffer persecution and doubt and despair. O oh God, comfort those who sorrow, strengthen those who suffer, and send your mercy to all in need. And lead us, O oh God, by the power of your spirit to live as love commands. As Jesus gave his life for ours, help us to live our lives for others. Give us the strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we shall feast with you in glory. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so it was on the night that he entered into the darkness of suffering, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Then, after the meal, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. When he reached this place, he withdrew from his disciples about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come in to the time of trial. Suddenly a crowd came and the one called Judas was leading them. When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike them with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. And the slave's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said to the temple police and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. And then they seized him and led him away. They brought him to the high priest's house. Peter was following them from a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, uh, this man also was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, surely this man was also with him, for he is a Galilean. 
But Peter said, I do not know what you are talking about. And at that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the scribes gathered together and brought Jesus before Pilate. After hearing him, Pilate said, I have examined this man and have not found him guilty. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. But the crowd shouted together, away with this fellow, release Barabbas instead. Barabbas was a man who had been in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts, that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. And Pilate handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching. The soldiers mocked him, saying, if you were the king of the Jews, save yourself. One of the criminals mocked him as well, but the other rebuked him, saying, oh, we have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus crying with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, surely this man was innocent. Now Joseph of Arimathea, a good and righteous man, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb. The drama of Jesus' final hours involves a large cast of characters. Peter, Thomas, Mary, Pilate, Judas. Men and women whose stories are told and retold during Holy Week. But as I read John's Gospel, I come across a name much less familiar. In his description of Jesus' arrest in the garden, John writes, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And then he adds, almost as an afterthought, the slave's name was Malchus. Malchus. Somehow the fact that his name is recorded in scripture, moves me. 
His story edges its way into my mind and my heart. What was this night like for him? What did it mean for his future? If he could talk to us, what might he say? Malchus says, if you've never been a slave, I'm not sure you can understand what it was like to spend every moment at your master's mercy. It, it wasn't the hard work that made life so painful. It was the invisibility to walk through a room and have people look right through you as if you didn't even exist. Actually, the only time anyone other than my fellow slaves spoke to me was when there was work to do. And if you think the fact that I was slave to the high priest meant that I had an easy life, <laughs> you couldn't be more wrong. He was a hard man to please, strict and exacting. That night, when he came to get me from the servants' quarters, I wasn't surprised. For the last few weeks, he had been nervous and on edge, reacting harshly for the slightest infraction. Only the day before, I had made the mistake of walking into a room without knocking. My master, Caiaphas, was talking to a, a thin man who jumped when I walked in as if he had been stabbed. Caiaphas glared at me with such ferocity that I backed out as quickly as I could and made myself scarce for the next several hours. But this evening, he was excited and with an excitement barely contained. Get up and get dressed, he barked. Go with the temple police and do whatever they tell you. Well, I knew better than to ask questions. And as fast as I could, I was out the door and we headed through the gate of the city, across the Kidron Valley and up the hill to a garden filled with olive trees. Most of all, I remember the darkness. It wasn't the pitch darkness of a moonless night, but a more terrifying darkness with fear swirling around like mist. In the flickering light of the torches, the shadows seemed to be alive with lurking beasts ready to pounce. The garden echoed with the sound of marching feet and calling voices, the clanging of armor and swords and a, a rustling in the air above, maybe birds disturbed by our coming, maybe the wind blowing through the leaves of the olive trees, maybe... But as fear began to rise up in a flood, we entered into the center of the garden. There, the smoking torches revealed a few men stumbling to their feet, rubbing their eyes, easing the stiffness from their bones. One man, however, stood out from the rest. His clothes were crumpled and wet as if he had been running in the heat of the day. He was wide awake, and as he moved out of the shadows toward us, I heard the man next to me chuckle. <laughs> look at that, Jesus. He doesn't look much like a king to me. Then I saw a familiar figure moving to meet him. The same man whose meeting with Caiaphas I had interrupted. He came up to this Jesus, and as they met, Right there in front of me, he greeted him with a kiss and whispered words I couldn't quite make out. I'll never forget the look in Jesus' eyes. They darkened with pain and grief. And for just a moment, his whole body seemed to sag as if a great load had been placed on his shoulders. He blinked as if to clear his mind. He straightened his back. And at that moment, everything seemed to explode with a burst of confusion. Voices shouting orders, screams of fear, people running and bumping into each other. Suddenly, someone huge hurtled past Jesus, bellowing and slashing the air with a short sword. 
At first, it felt like a stinging insect had attacked my ear. But a few seconds later, I felt unbearable pain. And as I pulled my hand away from my head, it was wet with blood. And I screamed. I screamed out all my pain and my humiliation. All the loss and grief and disappointment of my life were in that scream. But before I could make another sound, I felt a hand on my head. And a warmth began to work its way into the bleeding hole. I opened my eyes and Jesus stood there and looked right into my eyes. And he saw me. Even as the soldiers grabbed his arms to tie them behind his back, he looked at me. And I felt a healing energy move deep into the broken places of my heart and my spirit. How can I tell you what that moment meant to me? Ever since I was young and taken off as a slave, I had been told that I was nobody. I was worthless. And now, even in his own pain, this man, this Jesus, reached out to me, to Malchus, and I was made new. When you think about this night, remember me, not because I was so important, but because I wasn't important. And Jesus loved me anyway. I was there that night and I was changed forever. And so Jesus comes to you just as you are. Listen and know this is love. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there when they crucified?